Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming. You find here Sans jacket because it's bloody warm outside for a uh, day in October, but you also find me here reviewing the godlike role-playing game, a superhero role-playing game in a world on fire, specifically the years 1936 through to 1946. Now, Godlike is a game with which I've had something of a love-hate relationship. I love the setting, I adore the setting, I think the setting is one of the most well-thought-out settings that I have encountered in role-playing games. The rules, however, eh... And I've had difficulties with them. The first two times I ran this game, I really struggled with the rules, and it's only since my mind, my maturity, well, I have matured like a strong cheese, only since that has really happened that I have uh, come to appreciate the rule system for Godlike. And before I start getting into setting, I will go straight over the rules with you. If you're not familiar with One Roll Engine, that's basically what this is, by the way, uh, it's requires you to have a dice pool of ten-sided dice. So far, so storyteller system, I hear you cry. Well, not so. With those ten-sided dice, you're not trying to roll above a certain number in order to score a success. You're trying to score matches. By that, I mean, let's say you have two points in coordination with your character, and you have two points in rifle with your character. So you're trying to fire your rifle at some Ubergruppenfuhrer uh, walking in the middle of a field, let's say, because he's an idiot. So you fire your rifle, which means you, f uh, you roll four dice. Four dice, two for coordination, two for rifle. Let's say your result is a one, a three and a 5 and a 5. Okay? So you score 1, 3, 5, 5. You only count the matches as successes. So in this case, we have scored a width of 2, because we managed to get 2 dice that matched, and a height of 5, because the number that matched was a 5. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, if we have a look at the clients, the clients, the, uh, <laughs> the Nazis body chart there, if you can see it well enough, and I do love a role-playing game with body maps because they do make combat all that more lethal, as you can see, all of the parts of his body are numbered, and we can d determine with the height where it is on the body that we hit, and a 5 was one of his arms. The number of successes we scored, I believe we got 2, would imply that we have taken 2 points of health, 2 crosses, off of his arm. So he crossed through 2 boxes, and there's an automatic 1 with, let's say, a Lee Enfield rifle anyway. So that's 3 boxes off. So you see how that goes. That appears, in my mind, at least preliminarily, an elegant system, a swift system, and also a highly lethal system, which I enjoy. The problem is the random factor. You're no more likely, let's say, to score a success with rolling five dice as you are rolling two dice. While the bell curve of it all does mean that the more dice you roll, the, more, the bigger the likelihood of them matching just due to the sheer number of dice you're rolling. The fact is that if you roll 10d10, you've got just as much chance of them rolling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 as you have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So this does put some people's backs up. It certainly put my back up uh, for a while when I first tried playing this game because it seemed that no matter how good you were, you stood just as little a chance of shooting someone as the next poor bastard next to you, who may be a crack shot, or he may he may not know how to fire a gun, and you still have no chance of hitting someone. But anyway, I digress, I digress. My point is this system is actually very elegant given the setting, and now the setting. The setting is the Second World War, and the build-up to it, and so studies tell us that in the Second World War, at least, the American army, as well as the Japanese and the Germans, were missing 90% of the time that they fired. 
Why? Because all of the obstacle courses, all the training that they had, required them to fire at things like bullseyes, uh, required them to stab sacks of straw. This was before you got human-shaped targets uh, to aim at. This was before you had simulated environments with smoke, with explosion, explosion sound effects. And so it was very actually very difficult, whether you were a Nazi or whether you were one of the Allies, to shoot another human being unbelievably, as it may seem. And so, when you put it like that, if you want to incorporate any reality into a game, then Godlike is absolutely fantastic. It's a game set in the Second World War, where you're shooting at other human beings, and maybe they are Ubermensch, and we'll get onto that soon. But, needless to say, it's difficult to take another person's life, and not many other role-playing games convey that. I will agree that the One Roll Engine is probably a difficult one to run with in a different game, more four-colour adventure where you're expected to succeed. In Godlike, you're not really expected to succeed. In some ways, it's a bit like Cthulhu. It's punishing. And it's like a percentile system where you have a stat of 25 and you need to score below 25 to actually hit. You know, it's statistically less likely that you'll succeed than it is that you will. Some people have a great deal of issues with the godlike system. Personally, I do feel, on reflection, that it's a very good system for the setting. It evokes the lethality, the sheer random lethality, of standing in the middle of a field with bullets flying around you. Maybe one will hit you and blow your head clean off. Roll four tens, and you do just that. If you roll four tens in a row, that's it, someone's head's gone, that's it, they're out of the game. It doesn't matter if they're a player character, it doesn't matter if they are an enemy controlled by the GM. Four tens, that's your lot. Uh, roll five fours and you blow off someone's arm, and that's them pretty much out of the game as well. So, you may say that's a very harsh system, but I say that's war, you know, and war is supposed to be a bit harsh and lethal. On to the actual setting itself. In Godlike... In 1936, during the Munich Olympics, during the opening ceremony, the crowd suddenly found their gaze drawn to a flying man. A man was flying around the stadium, unsupported, unaided. He was a pinnacle of Aryan uh, supremacy. He was muscular, he was tanned, he had blonde hair. And somehow, this man was able to fly circuits around the arena. He was able to fly underneath an arch to show that he wasn't supported by anything. He was able to hover in place as well. And finally, he stopped off in the Führer's box and embraced Hitler. And Hitler embraced him back. And this made everyone in attendance go, wow, all this talk of Nazi ubermenschen is absolutely true. Except only one photographer managed to get a shot off. All the rest of them were too stunned to even take a photo, which I particularly like as part of the setting. Obviously, the rest of the world were disbelieving. If you weren't there, you didn't believe it. Until... Uh, Hitler, or oh, Goebbels rather, invited various representatives from various nations to meet the Flieger and see his talents. And so people like Joe Kennedy came over and, uh, and so on. And they all witnessed the Flieger. They could test him. They could ask him to do whatever they wanted to. And it became known across the world that Germany had the first ever Superman. Now that may not be your idea of good setting, but bear with me. During the run-up to the Second World War, with the uh, fervent nationalism, uh, well, of the fervent national socialism of Nazi Germany, uh, more and more Ubermenschen began to manifest. Some could fly, some were invulnerable to bullets, some were capable of disintegrating another man. Some could uh, reverse the inertia of someone and basically have them shooting up into the stratosphere. Some of them had powers that didn't even seem to be particularly useful. Some of them could change colour. Some of them could go insubstantial, but in going insubstantial they could no longer breathe because they became a gas and they had no lungs. So that happened. The Second World War started. Obviously it started with the Allies on something of a weaker foot because they thought, how were they going to face off against uh, Nazis where there were Ubermenschen, actual literal supermen. And then of course as the war progresses, the Allies start developing their own Ubermenschen because the talents, as they became known, the supermen, manifested due to mental, either you could call it stress, you could call it patriotism, you could call it just some great bearing on the mind of the person involved. It doesn't matter who they were. If they're in a situation of duress, or let's say, even say, a sense of patriotic fervour, 
then they could manifest a talent that would stay with them forever. Now, these talents aren't necessarily flawless, and this is why you are just as good a shot, let's say, as the next soldier standing beside you. Unless your superpower is that you have a hyper skill, let's say, in rifle, or a hyper stat in coordination, your, your shooting is the same as everyone else. But that doesn't mean you can't have a talent where you're impervious to bullets, or other kinetic energy. It doesn't mean you can't turn invisible. But what it does mean is every single superpower, given that it's grounded in mental power, essentially, it still has to abide by certain laws of physics. And this is where the setting, in my mind, as well as having a fantastic uh, timeline in it, if you like timelines in a game, this book, I, actually I won't show it, but this book has, I would say the bulk of it, uh, is a timeline uh, running from the beginning of the Second World War through to the end of it, and day by day, what was happening. Some of the events are real, some of them are not. And, in fact, it runs through the build-up to the Second World War as well. And each nation's reaction to the Supermen, how they utilise them, of course, what the Soviet Russians did with their Supermen was absolutely horrific, but I'll let you read it before you get to that. Um, and every single superpower is in some way flawed. I don't mean you take a benefit with a weakness. What I mean is, let's say you are impervious to fire. Your character is only impervious to fire, and you would design this in character creation stage, if, let's say, he's holding his rosary and saying Hail Marys. As soon as he stops saying Hail Marys, that's it. The fire is burning him just as well as it would burn anyone else. But let's say your character can only fly if he's singing to himself, or maybe he can only fly while his eyes are open, or something like that. You, you can make it up. Essentially, you can apply weaknesses and they make your powers cheaper to buy. And it's a mechanical thing. Uh, you can put, uh, you basically buy dice in a power, so you can basically say, like, I've got five points in um, hyperstat body, which means you are like the Hulk, but only if you roll matches on those five dice, and they are added on to your normal body stat. Let's say, instead, you, rather than buying three dice, you buy Three, well, let's say instead of buying five dice, rather, you buy three normal dice, but you also buy f two wiggle dice, as they're called in the game. What are wiggle dice? Well, you can roll your three normal dice, and then you choose what your wiggle dice come up as. Obviously, they cost more, generating the incentive of picking flaws so that you can afford these wiggle dice. You can also buy hard dice that will always come up as tens. Now, that may sound better than wiggle dice, they're slightly cheaper than wiggle dice, but it also means you have no control over the power of your superpower. So, for instance, let's say you have a hyper body, as, we, as our character did there, the Hulk, and he wants to knock someone out. Unfortunately, he's always going to roll a match on two tens, which means he will always, essentially, do damage to the head. Which also means he's likely to kill whoever he does his power uses his power on, which may be fine in a wartime scenario, but let's say he just wants to do something subtly. Maybe he just does want to knock someone out. And I think it just adds a nice layer to this. You also get layers such as if you have the power of invisibility, you can't see. Your eyes are no longer a, uh, an opaque material, so there's nothing for the sunlight to refract off of, therefore you are blind. Mentioning tra insubstantiality, you can turn into what is essentially a gas, therefore you would fall through the floor, unless you turned insubstantial whilst leaping. Uh, so it's only really useful if you run up to a wall, turn insubstantial, go through the wall, turn it off again, and land. And of course you can't breathe because you've got no lungs if you're insubstantial. You could have nervous habits, like uh, you may be spit acid, but uh, the nervous habit is that you are, have to constantly spit. And... So you've got all these characters who are superpowers in the Second World War, and it's just as lethal for them, really, as it is for any other soldier. While they may have superpowers that may defend them against certain things, or may make them good at certain things, all it actually means is for the vast majority of the time, their chiefs uh, of staff, their commanders, send them in first, which is why the Talent Operation Group, the American branch of talents, their slogan is, we go first. They are always the shock troops that are sent in first, so it means talents die more often than not. So, 
as this review is coming to an end, all I can say is the setting itself is brilliant and rich. The uh, amount of powers in the game is likewise good. The system, you will either love it or you will hate it, but I have personally come to see it as very elegant and very evocative of the lethality of war. I do recommend this game, and expansions are still being released for it, in PDF as well as in print in some cases, so do check it out, and thank you very much for watching.